four years ago, back in 2015, marked the beginning of my bicycle touring adventures. In this video, I want to discuss about two stories that helped change and shape my life. I also want to talk about what cycling or bicycle touring or traveling in the United Kingdom is like, what kind of budget you should be aiming for if you want to travel there, what the people are like, what the nature is like. I'm originally from the UK, so I want to get into talking about where I'm actually originally from. After talking about both of these stories, I then want to get into some of the reflection on doing this trip like four years ago now, because it's 2019. So let's start off with the first trip. So like I said, back in August of 2015, I was in the Netherlands at the time, and I took the ferry over from Hoek van Holland to Harwich, and I arrived back at my hometown of Woodbridge in Suffolk. Before I actually began to even plan the trip to go to Wales, I wanted to do a hiking trip, and I also wanted to do another cycling long distance trip as well to experiment. I was still in this experimental phase, so so I took the bike from Harwich and I rode up to the North Norfolk coast. And then I rode along the East Angulan coast back down towards Woodbridge. Then I did another trip after that. I did a 111 mile hike or tour around Suffolk, the county of Suffolk. And I then chose, okay, do I want to do a bike trip or do I want to do a hiking trip? I chose to go with the bike because it would be quicker. I knew that hiking from England to Wales would have taken longer, so I took the bike. I took the bike out of the garage, and I put my dad's old pannier bags on the back of the bike, and I left the house, and away I went. That was the beginning of my bicycle touring adventure, really. So I left from Woodbridge, I went to Cambridge, and then I went towards Bedford, Milton Keys, Banbury, then I arrived at the Cotswolds. The Cotswolds is a really lovely park. It's kind of like a protected area, but it's still kind of like countryside. Arrived at Gloucestershire, and then I got to Ross and Wye, which is at the border of the Welsh border. At the Welsh border was really lovely. I found a campsite, and it was in right next to a river, and there was some beautiful forest along there. And I then packed up the next day, and I went towards the Brecon's National Park. I stayed at a nice YHA hostel there, which I remember. I met some interesting people, other people who inspired me to do more touring. One guy who was doing big bike trips around Wales. But then I met another guy who was a professor at like Oxford or something. And he was telling me about or challenging me about what kind of path I was taking. Because I, I actually left school and early to be homeschooled. And it was a very different path, and I really didn't know exactly what I was doing. I just knew that it, it felt like school system wasn't really for me at the time. So I had a pretty challenging conversation about what my future was with this guy. I then went through the Brecon's National Park, which is like these beautiful little peaks, which you can actually see from Cardiff. And it's a lovely park. I highly recommend going there. It's just that the tourism can be quite a lot in summer. I went towards Cardiff, stayed with a friend in Cardiff. Cardiff was a lovely city. I really liked being there, and it was great catching up with some friends. I then left the next morning, and I went along the Bristol Channel's coastline to kind of say I went on the west coast. I left Cardiff, and I went towards Bristol, took the this big bridge, which was an old motorway, towards Bristol, went to Bath, visited some of the Roman baths, stayed with a friend there. I then went through more of the English countryside, and I tried to avoid going through many of the big cities and towns. I wasn't a huge fan of riding in towns at the time. And I stayed at another YHA hostel. I stayed at a lot of YHA hostels in the beginning. I didn't really know about couch surfing yet, which is what I'll get into in my next story. And then from there, I arrived at Maidstone. And Maidstone is actually where I'm originally born. I wanted to discover my roots. I went into the hospital. I tried to even find a place where I was born, but actually it was changed into a different unit. So, But it was still interesting to see where I was originally from. I found like a thatched house, which was where I originally grew up for most of my life. I then arrived back on the East Coast, and I then continued to head to France. I took the ferry from Dover to Calais, and that whole French trip where I went through all of France is a whole nother story. But that is essentially the trip that really set the bar for 
the beginning of my bicycle touring adventures. And it was the first trip I ever did on my own. I was 16 years old at the time. And it was my first baby steps of actually traveling on my own. The second story that I want to mention was when I actually rode from the southeast coast of England, again from my hometown of Woodbridge in Suffolk, and I rode all the way up to Fort William in Scotland along the west coast of the Scottish Highlands. So roughly around the beginning of August 2016, a year later from when I did my other trip in the UK, which was in August 2015, I arrived at Kings Lynn. That was the first place I arrived. I then went to Lincoln, then I arrived at Leeds, which was a big city and it was kind of intense to cycle through, but there was, there was some nice national parks and nice cute little parks around the area there. I got to see how small some of the English houses are and how some of us live in pretty cramped living conditions sometimes in the UK. I then arrived at the Scottish border, not far from Carlisle. And I arrived at Langham and then I went towards Glasgow. And then I got to the Trossachs National Park, which was absolutely stunning. Very busy road though, so you just keep that in mind that you might want to wear like a high-vis jacket when you're cycling on there. And then I arrived at Glencoe. Glencoe Valley was absolutely beautiful. That's actually where like Harry Potter's like Hagrid's house was actually filmed through that area. After going through the Glencoe Valley, I arrived at Fort William, which is actually at the base of the mountain known as Ben Nevis, which is like one of the highest points of the UK. It's only like 1300 meters, but still it was, it was nice. I didn't actually hike up there because the weather was not so good then. And I actually chose another mountain south of there. As I was going down south, I stayed with another host not in the Trossachs National Park. And I hiked up a mountain called Ben Eim, which was really gorgeous, really beautiful views. And I think it was a lot less touristic as well. So that was good to keep in mind. I then stayed with some friends again at Glasgow, which I'll get into later with who I actually stayed with. I then went towards Dumfries. I arrived at Carlisle. I got to the Lake District, which was really gorgeous. I was surprised that England has really nice nature still left within its borders. And stay with a nice couch surfing host there. I got to Manchester. I tried to avoid Manchester's like central part of the city as much as I could because the traffic was pretty insane around there. And then the trip was really being shaped by who I was staying with at the time. So I'll get into couch surfing in, in a minute. And then I avoided Birmingham as much as I could. I arrived back at the Cotswolds outstanding national beauty park. I can't really remember how it goes. And then I got towards High Wycombe. High Wycombe was where some of my family members were located. So I stayed with them, which was kind of nice to catch up with them. Then continued to go from High Wycombe, where my family, some of my family members are, and caught the ferry at Portsmouth down through towards France and did another big trip after that. But that's, that's a whole nother story. So that's essentially where I stayed along the trip and the route that I took through the UK. And before we move on from that second story about cycling from England to, to Scotland, I want to just mention about the people that I stayed with. So I used Couchsurfing. Couchsurfing is an app where you can write to other hosts or travelers to meet them along your traveling. And it's, it's, it's a really cool app. I re recommend just having a look at the Couchsurfing website and then you'll learn about it more in detail. I remember how grateful I was for all the couch surfers and still am. I'm so grateful for all those couch surfers that hosted me, friends who also hosted me in the UK, all the way up in Scotland and around that area. And it really helped cut the costs a lot of my traveling, I have to admit. So as you can clearly see, I was traveling on quite a budget through the camera quality that I even had at the time. I just had my smartphone and I was just taking pictures and a few little videos here and there. Let me, let me discuss actually about the budget. So... On August 2015, that month, I spent a little less than 500 pounds. That was, that was how much I spent. And then a year later, this second trip, which was even longer than the first trip, when was it? It was in August 2016, then spent around 250 pounds. I learned how to spend half of the costs of living accommodation. Uh, I spent like half the costs on food because I, I learned what I was going to eat during the day. I learned what to avoid and what to visit on my travel. I think a lot of these trips is like you need to learn really what works for you and how, what your budget is because everybody's budget is going to be slightly different. Like I said, I spent like twice as much on my first trip 
And then I learned how to spend a lot less, which is kind of interesting. So those are both of the stories. Those are two of the trips that I did for my first trips in the United Kingdom. The whole trip was inspired for me to explore my roots and really understand about my homeland. And I would really encourage other people in the UK to go and travel around the UK and or actually if you're even outside the UK to discover the UK. It, it's, it's got a lot of history. It's got a lot of different people and cultures within its borders. You've got Wales, England and Scotland and Northern Ireland and all of them are different. Like Suffolk is completely different to Yorkshire and I find that really fascinating and it was it was very enlightening seeing about you know the small houses that people live in and the budget that people actually live in. Not all of the UK is that wealthy you know people think that we're all lords and we have sip cups of tea all day long but there's a lot of people like you know hustling to try and make ends, ends meet you know. So doing these trips, what was really fascinating for me, especially my first trip back in 2015, is it, in, it taught me how to do even bigger trips. Now we'll get into some of the advice about cycling in the UK or traveling in the UK and what to expect. So budget-wise, I would say that campsites are everywhere all over the UK, like when it comes to accommodation. And they are fairly cheap. They're between like 10 and 20 pounds. But then if you want to stay indoors, then... Hostels are the preferred method, and those are between 15 to 25 pounds. And then Airbnb, I wouldn't really do that personally. It's kind of expensive in the UK. Um, there are a lot of nice B&Bs and stuff like that. It's just that I, I prefer camping because it's cheaper. And, and then I use couch surfing. So couch surfing was really a big help with cutting the cost of accommodation. And plus, you get to actually hang out with the locals and really, like, get to know the country and the town that you're staying in, you know? Weather-wise in the UK, it does rain a lot, it's pretty cloudy, so try to go there in summer to enjoy a lot of the summer. The weather in summer is a lot better, the sunshine is out, the heat is on, and it's just beautiful, and the countryside in England's lovely. Let's get into the nature. The nature, I would highly recommend to go on the west coast of the UK. That's where like all of the rugged cliffs, lines and mountains are. The east coast is a bit more soft. It looks a bit more like um, Denmark. It's like flat rolling hills and countryside. Now, if I'm honest about the people, the people can be a little bit 50-50. So I did encounter that when you're in a town is that people are a bit more to themselves. They're a bit more nervous about who you are as a traveler. So that sometimes it's it's like you don't really get the help that you need sometimes. It really can depend. Like, and then I said 50-50. So the other 50% of the time, I found people who were incredibly helpful and really raised the bar for what I thought was, was considered hospitality in the UK. I was like really amazed by some of the friends and, and couch surfers that I met. So it can widely change. I think in the countryside, it's a bit better than being in the center of a city. Try to plan out who you're going to stay with in a city. Um, and I think the countryside is a bit more like you can just roll up at a campground and like talk with the owner and get to know them. And it's, it's a lot more easygoing in the countryside. Food wise in the UK, it's basically just baked beans and toast and tea. And that's about it. No, I'm just kidding. There's a lot of options when you go to Tesco's. That's like the best thing to do. And that's like everywhere in the UK. Lidl's pretty cheap. Lidl is all over the UK and Aldi, I think. I I would just recommend to go to those stores. And when you go to a restaurant, that's kind of expensive. The pub can be a little bit cheaper. It really depends. You can spend like around 20 pounds on a meal just for one person, which is kind of pricey. Or you can go to like McDonald's and then spend like 10 pounds, which is not, I would just avoid McDonald's if you can. That's my opinion. But food wise in the UK, there are a lot of options. It's a very like multicultural understanding place, actually. Cycle paths in the UK, there aren't actually that many. So let's talk about the road network in the UK. I would highly recommend having a look at the National Cycle Network. That will help you get from A to B. Google Maps tries to follow that as much as possible, but planning to go around the National Cycle Network, I would highly recommend to do that. The A roads and the B roads in the UK are not very nice. Try and stick to countryside roads. And bike paths, I do remember like going from like Bristol to Bath. There was a small little bike path. It was all off the main road and it was lovely. So occasionally you'll find little hidden gems here and there, but try and take those countryside roads and follow that National Cycle Network.
Fun fact, when you're in Scotland, is actually you can wild camp anywhere within the Scottish borders, uh, which is great. So just avoid going to those big cities. And the Trossachs National Park, I think there's some weird laws around there that you can't camp there. But when you're in when you're not on private land, so it's like you need to look for that public land and like being in nature, you can basically wild camp anywhere. Just respect the nature and clean up your trash and such and then pack up early morning and 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 set up the tent at late at night and stuff. And then that that's fine for wild camping in Scotland. So last but not least, I want to discuss about some afterthoughts of why and what got me into this and reflection about this whole story and all of these adventures. I personally learned that less technically does equal more. For me, it actually, I took like that minimal approach to like take a lot less items with me to really narrow down what I wanted to take with me and what was essential for me. Doing that practically can also translate to how you live and like get on with your life during the day. I learned that you don't actually need a lot of money to do a bike trip or to do traveling or anything of that matter because like I said I spent 250 pounds in a month traveling top to bottom of the United Kingdom. You really don't need a lot of money. The bike obviously helped me save a lot of money because I wasn't paying for fuel other than like the food I was eating. I was going from point A to point B with my own power and I saved a lot of money with the camping that I did and with the hostels and with the couch surfing that I did. So, I mean, like I said, my budget was pretty thin, so I did kind of look like a bum on a bike. But other than that, I, I, I don't think you need a lot of money to travel, actually. You will be limited on what you can do while you're traveling. You can't stay at a five-star ho hotel. You can't go to a restaurant every night and pay 50 pounds on a meal. But you learn to really appreciate the little things in life and you learn to really minimalize. And I think you really learn to appreciate what you have. Now it's 2019. I think I can see this trend that I've been talking with other friends about recently, which is that millennials, our gener or my generation, are starting to experience life in a way that we want to gain experience and have experiences rather than having material things and this whole thing about capitalism and stuff like this, which it, it kind of reflects how I've been doing all of this traveling for the last four years. I, I don't want to carry all this stuff with me. I'm not attached to things as I once was. And I just learned to really value and just have an experience whether it was good or bad, which was which is really interesting, I think. So I'm going to leave it at that, that you don't need a lot of money to have life-changing experiences. You just got to get out there and take those first baby steps.